Hello, welcome to the opening video from Long Arm Dash Tech, where our mission is to delight the discerning quilter by helping them optimize the technical performance of their long arms and frames. If you like what you see, please subscribe, comment, ask questions for us to answer in future videos, and check out our website and Facebook page. My name is Keith Hayes, and adding to a nearly 40-year telecom career in senior engineering and operations roles for companies like Charter Communications and Adelphi Communications, I also repair, service, and optimize long-arm quilting machines and frames. I'm joined today by my wife, Pam, who is an accomplished free-motion long-arm quilter with more than a decade of experience. The reason I became a long-arm tech, you got to keep the frame smooth and level and the long arms humming. Just a few hours ago, this frame was nearly completely disassembled. Stay tuned to learn how to assemble, level, and perform basic optimization of multi-sectional long arm quilting frames. Today, we will be assembling a mostly disassembled long arm modular sectional frame, the type you find made by Handy Quilter, Baby Lock, Janome, and other brands. The techniques discussed in this video are for basic assembly and alignment. There are future videos coming that will take you through intermediate and advanced optimization if more precision is needed for your setup. Also, in addition to this video, and particularly if you are assembling a new Handy Quilter frame, I highly recommend this video from Handy Quilter. The link will also be in the notes below the video screen. The alignment of the frame is critically important to the ease and quality of your quilting, particularly if you are a free motion quilter. You will note that even though this frame was moved only a few hundred feet from my shop down into our basement, it was almost completely disassembled. The reason for this is it's very easy to damage, bend, or warp a multi-sectional frame if you try to move them as a unit. Check out the bent leg from a move where the frame was not disassembled. Let's cover the basics of alignment optimization for a quilting frame. There are three planes since it's a three-dimensional object. Its length, from left to right, in this case about 12 feet when we assemble it. Its depth, front to back, about 2 feet. Height. It's adjustable depending on your preference with the spring clips and the legs. And this is the area where it is most important to ensure levelness, flatness, and alignment. More on this shortly. Here are the tools that are needed. A four millimeter, five millimeter hex tool. This will uh, attach most of the fasteners to the frame. A 14 millimeter open end or box end wrench. This will hold the nut on for the side arms. A 19 millimeter wrench. This will adjust the feet to get the level for the to get the frame level. You'll see in this case both the wrenches are ratcheting. In some cases, makes that a lot easier to get fasteners tight. Next, you'll need a spirit or bubble level. You'll see I've got two of them, and I actually have a third trick tool. That's a digital level. If you happen to have one of these available, they're only 20 bucks, but it really lets you calibrate that uh, you're precisely level and not have to vary. Uh, what your eyes see with the bubble level. Next, we have a carpenter square. This one happens to be magnetic. This will allow us to ensure that there's an exactly 90 degree angle between the leg and the top sections. A headlight or a flashlight, so when we're underneath putting the tracks on, we'll be able to see the fasteners easily. If you happen to have one available and the floor is hard, you may want a mechanics dolly or creeper that'll let you roll around underneath the frame with a lot more ease than uh, crawling and scooting on your back and butt. You need a helper. Uh, mine will be joining shortly that will uh, help you line up the initial frame assembly. And the two most important things I haven't brought out yet, that will be your carriage for your long arm quilting machine and then your long arm quilting machine itself. And we'll go through that at the very end of the process to ensure that we have an exactly flat level and completely optimized quilting frame. Let's go through the components we'll be assembling. First, we have the right side and left side legs. In this case, you will see the side brackets have been left on them to ease the assembly. Next, we have the middle support legs that will help connect the top sections together. We have the left and right pole arms that will hold the poles for the quilting top on the machine. We have splice brackets that will connect the sides of the legs on the left and right side. 
we have angle brackets that will connect the three sections of the top frame together. We have the top sections themselves. In this case, I have three four foot sections for a 12 foot frame. And then we have the tracks or rails. You'll see the track is a piece of uh, solid extruded aluminum. In this case, it's 12 feet long. Many frames have sections that are broken in four or two foot sections that have splices that have to be aligned. In this case, we don't have that particular challenge. You'll also see we have a uh, black plastic track or rail on the top of it that the carriage wheels glide on. That's it for these parts. We will not be putting the poles on in this particular assembly. We'll cover that in a later video. Please note that there is an alternative assembly technique that would require you to assemble the frame upside down. In fact, that's the one that's discussed in the Handy Quilter video. But there are risks. You could bend the legs, the couplings, and top sections if the frame is not carefully rotated to move it upright. The techniques we will show you in this video assemble the frame upright, but it also has risk, and that's why it's important that you have a partner so to ensure that when you're assembling the components, you don't bend anything. Bending is not good. Most of the time when you bend something, it cannot be unbent. You gotta remember all these pieces of metal give you a very, very long lever and a lot, the ability to put a lot of pressure on a frame component that might bend it. So be gentle and be careful. Now I don't have casters on this frame. I have feet, as you can see here. They screw in and up and down to adjust it. Casters are rotating wheels and they're nice if you have to have them because you gotta frequently move your frame like a couple of times a month, several times a year. If you don't have to have casters, my personal opinion is you should not use them. Casters have a number of disadvantages. Number one, they provide a point of leverage that allows the frame to rock a little bit more than they would on feet. They have a smaller contact patch than feet do. They are toe stubbers that I've seen quilters put pieces of styrofoam around the casters to keep from banging them with their toes. And if you stub them with your toe, you could very easily spin the caster around and change the levelness of your frame. So if you gotta have them because you need to move your machine frequently, so be it. But if you don't need them, I would encourage you just to put the solid feet on. You have a much more rigid frame, it'll vibrate less, and you'll be a much happier quilter. Another tool that's very handy is a magnetic parts holder. You can get these for about three bucks at Harbor Freight or Northern Tool. Please do not buy the ones that are sold for 20 bucks at the quilt shows. If you really want to waste your money, call me and I'll sell you one for 10. How about that? Before you start assembling a frame, please read and follow the manufacturer's instructions in the manual or videos if they have them. The tips I'm providing are intended to augment the manufacturer documentation. So get it, read it, understand it, follow it. Hello everyone, this is my wife Pam. She's the decade plus, very accomplished free motion quilter that got me into the long arm service and support business. So she's gonna be my grunt, if you will, in the assembly of this frame. So she's holding one of the middle legs. I'm gonna pick up the first top section, connect it to the left leg, and put a couple of fasteners in it to allow it to be stable enough that it's not gonna rock and potentially fall down. Gently put the frame section in the middle leg, and rotate the left leg and it will sit on top of the tube sections allowing me to put two fasteners in. The reason I want to put two fasteners instead of one is it will stop it from pivoting. It's reasonably solid good enough to let me go to the next step. Now we have both side sections gently put together. We're going to drop the center section in. Now we have rough assembly. Next we'll start lining everything up using the carpenter square so we have a complete 90 degree angle between the feet and the top. One thing to check in this initial alignment is that you've got all your spring clip settings at the same level. And let me zoom in and show you. So you can see here we've got one, two, three, four slots before the spring clip. You can look on the back we have the same thing, middle of the same thing, of the, and then on the right side, same thing, both sides. I have seen frames that even had machines on them that had 
one or two slots uh, out of alignment with no possibility of getting the machine level. Also, you will note that there are blue labels on either side. So if you're disassembling a frame and moving it, I would encourage you to match the sides up. So you see uh, joint A pointing to the right from the left, joint A pointing to the left from the center, joint B pointing to the right from the right center, and then joint B pointing to the left from the right side. That way you can ensure your frame sections that were perfectly aligned in the past, you're not swapping something up and make it easier for you to get it level as you put it back together. Okay, I've gone around the frame and have put in all the leg screws very loosely. And now it's time to start lining up the left and right legs to make sure they're exactly vertical to the tabletop. And as you can see on this one, if I put a light behind it, you can see the light clearly coming through the gap because the leg is slightly out of plumb. So let's talk a little bit about why we want to make sure the leg and tabletops are at a 90 degree alignment with each other. Uh, the main reason is to ensure there's not abnormal torque uh, and or there's a, a, a force that's trying to bend the tabletop either up or down. If the two sections are level, they are designed to fit smoothly together like that and you don't put abnormal uh, pressure on them that may cause some sort of bending and ultimately a warp or bend or bump in the frame which will cause quilting issues. To quickly help me tell whether it's the table that's not plumb or the leg that's not, I put my magnetic digital scale on it and as you can see when I zoom in it's at 0.0, .0 degrees which tells me I am level and then when I go put it on the leg itself it should read 90 degrees but instead it's reading 89.75 degrees so I'm about a quarter degree out of alignment so I will gently tamp the leg to get it into the 90 degree area and now it says 90 degrees and we've got no gap between the carpenter square and the top so it's time to snug these bolts up. I'm not going to tighten them, I'm just going to snug them. The ones on the leg are already tightened from where it was assembled before. I'm going to go do the same thing on the back on this leg and then repeat it on the right leg. Okay, I now have the left and right legs attached, snugged, and square, both uh, horizontal and vertical, zero degrees and 90 degrees. Now it's time to get to the inner legs. So I'm on the right middle leg now, and I have a second small magnetic spirit level in addition to my magnetic level. And if you look at the magnetic level, you can see it's showing it's 2.1 degrees out of plumb. And then if you look at the top bubble on the spirit level, you can clearly see it's way over to the right. So we can pretty easily fix that, but let me show you what that does to the leg. So if you look up at the top where the leg sits, you can see the top sections are not sitting in it flat. So if you happen to tighten it up this way, and I've seen people do this when they've assembled it upside down, it can create uh, joint problems that will cause quilting issues. Let me show you that up at the very top of it. You see how the right section is much higher than the left section? So by aligning this, this will help us get it much closer and hopefully perfect. And if not, we'll have some other techniques we can show you to get it where it needs to be. Right, I'm gonna gently tamp the leg until it gets to zero. All right, we're at zero and the bubble's in the center and we're sitting much closer to level at the top joint. Still not perfect, but we're good enough that we can snug it up and move on to the next step. All right, we're gonna take the phone off the tripod for a little bit and see how the image stabilization of this app works. Okay, you can see we've got a, a pretty big gap here, even though we're pretty close to level at the top. 
the side sticking out. You can see you can move around some. And let me show you underneath how we fix that. You may have noticed that the fasteners have a much bigger hole than their shaft needs. And that lets you slide the top sections left and right and up and down to be able to optimize alignment. Now left and right is much easier because you have the channel for it to lay in. If you're going to have to move it up and down, uh, it's going to rely on just the torque of the fastener to hold it and it's likely to shift over time. We'll have some techniques to show you how to improve that in the intermediate video. The next step, I'm going to install one of the couplers on the side of the frame. These aren't terribly uh, critical. They don't have any uh, solid pieces they're holding together. They're just providing stability to connect the two legs into the frame top. So we don't have to get the level or uh, spirit gauge out or anything like that. I'm just going to start the fasteners and go from there. And I'm not going to tie... I'm not going to torque them down yet because I want to make sure every part of the table is straight, flat, level before I torque all the fasteners down. Our next step is to install the angle couplers that connect the top sections together, both from the side and the bottom. And the beauty of this is if you have a little bit of uh, what I would call nonlinearity on the top, you've got one higher or lower than the other, or on the front, this can help bring them together, line them up. And that's why we leave the other fasteners a little bit loose. So when we start tightening these, it'll pull the top into alignment. So I'll just get a couple of these started and we'll tighten them up. And I'll show you some other alignment checks after I get all four of these temporarily installed. Okay, we're off the tripod again. I've got this first clamp installed. And let me show you something that's very important to check. You need to take a straight edge. In this case, we're going to use a carpenter square. You could use a level or a piece of straight angle iron, whatever you have handy. And you want to slide it across this joint both ways. And you want to make sure it's smooth, that one side or the other is not higher or lower. You can see it's just sliding nice and smooth, which is exactly what we want. Because if we did have something higher or lower, when you put your track there, it's going to cause perhaps a slight bend in it enough that a sensitive, proficient quilter might feel it. And if that's the case, they're going to be coming after you to figure out what's wrong and get it fixed. Okay, now I've got all the frame sections uh, snug but not overly tight. We will torque them down later after we get uh, the tracks on and make sure everything's square and smooth and flat and level. So let's put the tracks on now. So if you haven't done this before, you'll see the tracks have some uh, uh, perforations, some legs that extend down. This goes towards the outside. You can see there's plastic in the middle. So the outside where it's a little bit thicker, that compensates for where there's no plastic. So this one will go on the rear of the frame. And the other one will go on the front of the frame. Except I gotta put it on correctly. Okay, now let's go get one of our important tools we talked about, and that is our carriage. So in this case, this particular machine has a pro stitcher on it. So it has a much heavier carriage than one that does not. You can see it's got motors and gears and its own power cord. And while we put this carriage on here, you can see it's got eight wheels, four on each side in an inverted V formation that ride on top of these tracks. So what we're gonna do is put one of the, we're gonna put the rear track pretty close to the back as straight as we can get it. Uh, we really don't care if it's oriented to the front or the back as long as it's got enough room to move to allow the carriage to make it parallel. So what we're going to do is let these wheels, while they're moving, they're going to move the tracks around to make them parallel. So we're going to roll it back and forth several times, making the tracks parallel. 
you could hear that one just uh, pop down as it went into place. What I'm going to do now is get underneath and put the fasteners in, but I'm not going to tighten them. I'm just going to lay them down or, tight, or gently put them in. I won't tighten them until I put the machine on top of the carriage and do the same process, rolling it back and forth. And then I'll show you as I tighten it how I let the machine hold those rails in exact parallel orientation. Up to this point, all the fasteners, believe it or not, have been five millimeter. This particular one for the tracks is a four millimeter. So we need to change our hex tool to the four millimeter. And this is one where our mechanics crawler can really come in handy, making it easy to get under the table because you have to look up to be able to put the fasteners in. Some people can put them in without uh, seeing them just by feel, but that risks the danger of losing the fastener inside the frame. Done that before, it's not impossible. You can get a magnet or some uh, little grabber tool to extract it. Worst case, you have to take the frame apart and shake it to get it out. Uh, so that's why I prefer to put it in where I can see it. And that way it risk or it doesn't risk losing it or cross-threading it as you're putting the fastener in. So let's go put one in. The headlight also comes in real handy here so you can see up in the hole to get the fastener aligned. So you've got two fasteners on each side, front and rear perception. So I've got one here, one here, about a foot away from either end. So because I'm at this one, I'm going to put this one in and I will get the camera in a minute and show you what the fastener insertion looks like from the bottom. So I've got it threaded and I'm just, it's not even snug, it's just hanging there. Okay, now you can see the hole for the fastener on the track. One thing to notice is there's a big hole, so you can move it around. Let me move it. You can see it. I have to get the light in there where you can see it, but you can see the hole moving. What that does is that lets you, before you secure the fastener, make sure that track is exactly parallel before you lock it in place. That way you've got a nice, smooth, even surface, and you're not going to have the carriage fighting uh, the vagaries of the track as it moves along. It's just going to have a nice smooth surface to roll on. Okay, I've been intentionally made the tracks too close together. They're not quite parallel in one spot. I'm going to show you what that causes. You can see there's about a eighth of an inch gap between the wheel and the track. And what that's going to do when the machine rolls towards the back, it's going to cause the carriage to pop down and cause the machine to wiggle and cause the quilter to not be happy. You can hear the carriage moving, but if we go down to the other end where it's parallel, I can't shake it and make it move any. So that's why it's real critical to ensure these tracks are exactly parallel. And in terms of the wheels touching, uh, they don't all have to touch all the time. You've got a very heavy machine moving back and forth. The guidance from uh, one of the major manufacturers is as long as six of the eight are in good contact with the track, you're in good shape. What you don't want to see is a noticeable gap. Uh, even the thickness of a paper is, uh, is too much gap, and certainly if it's more than that, you've got something that's not in proper alignment. All right, here we go with the wrench on the foot. It doesn't take much. All right, so I spun it about one. And that didn't really make, that's right at, it took it, it's bouncing between zero and point one five. So we're gonna take it about another half turn. All right, it took about two and a half turns, but now we're at zero there. Staying at zero. All right, let's start looking at it the other way. 
Okay, I'm on the right end, and the very right end is about a quarter degree low. You can see the bubble is over towards the left. And you see I'm putting the level on the track because the plastic is uh, somewhat weak. It can have bends and bumps and dips between the support members, and your carriage doesn't run on the plastic. So the track is what you want to make sure is as close to level as you can possibly get it. So I'm going to go spin the right legs up a little bit and see if we can get this straight. All right, it took about two and a half turns and the front is at zero and the rear is at zero as well. Let's go down the rest of the frame. We're at zero in the rear. Zero in the front. Looks like we're about a two tenths of a degree off in the front. Four tenths of a degree off, five tenths of a degree off in the back. So I have to do some work on the left side here. Good news is if the center's at zero, it's easier to work on the two sides to make it match to what the center is. All right, we've now got the left side at zero. So let's put the carriage back on and work on getting it parallel. All right, before we get into the final paralleling process, let me show you something at the joints. Take a straight edge. In this case, I'm going to use this uh, metal level. Put it across your joint at the top of the track and see if you can rock it. If you can't, which I'm not able to, that tells you you don't have any kind of hump, dip, gap, bump at that joint that might cause you quilting irregularities. We'll check the other one. Nice and solid. This one nice and solid. I'll put a picture in the video that shows you a uh, example gap where there was a, probably a two tenths of a two, ten, two millimeter uh, gap between the if it was held straight on one side, the level on the other side because there was a slight gap that bent the track up, a slight bump rather, that built the track up. So watch out for that. Uh, level a carpenter square, any type of straight edge, put it on top of the track and you can see if you've got a potential bump there that uh, again, a proficient sensitive free motion quilter is gonna find. All right, now I've got the machine on the carriage ready to make sure we've got exactly parallel rails. So I'm gonna start rolling it all the way to one side, go all the way to the right, all the way back to the left. One thing to make note of, as you can probably tell, I'm a technologist. I trust in measurements and accuracy, and if my level says zero, I believe it's zero. If the bubble's in the middle, I believe it's level. But the quilter only cares, does that machine move when it stops? Does it move left, right? Does it move front, rear? And if it's not moving, the quilter's happy. And if it is moving, the quilter is unhappy. So always check multiple spots, even after you get the frames parallel. Make sure you've got six wheels at least touching everywhere, no matter what position on the carriage the machine is. And then when you let it go, it stops. All right, so I've gone back and forth several times, getting the loose rails parallel, the loose tracks parallel, making sure the table's level so the machine's not moving. And now I'm going to take the machine so that one set of wheels is on top of one set of fasteners. So I'm going to feel underneath the carriage, the fasteners right where my middle finger is. I'm going to put the carriage right on top of it. And I'm going to get underneath there and tighten those fasteners up. All right, I'm tightening up the far right set of fasteners. Nice and tight first the front. Then the rear. All right, and we'll move the carriage. So the left set of wheels is on top of the next set of fasteners. 
and we'll tighten them. This time first the rear. In the front, what's that doing? That's the wheels on the carriage are holding the tracks parallel while you tighten and giving no chance for the tracks to weave their way in or out. And go into the next set. Front. And you don't want to over tighten these because if you do, it can bend that soft aluminum track down and create a dip. And your sensitive, proficient free motion quilter is going to feel that too. Ask me how I know. All right, now I'm going to put on the pole brackets. And one thing you should always do is before you take it apart, see what slot they're in. I actually took a picture on mine so I could go back and refer to it. If you can see, you can see where clearly the fan string was in the very bottom hole. So I gotta pull the screws out, slide the clamp over, and also note if you were in the top or bottom hole on the inside bracket, I know I was on the bottom. Slid in the top there. Good. All right. There's one. There's other. And this is where you need the 14 millimeter wrench. So you've got to put a washer on both these. Thread the nut on as far as you can go with your fingers. Get your five millimeter hex wrench to hold the fashion on the outside and get your 14 millimeter wrench to tighten it. Since this is a ratchet, I have to turn it in the right direction. And these don't have to be super tight. All right, then we'll do that on the other side. And we'll be done with the frame except for the Pro Stitcher track. I hope you enjoyed the first video from longarm-tech.com where our mission is to delight the discerning quilter by the optimization of their machines and frames and by answering any questions, providing education, technical support to help them enjoy their passionate hobby. Today we learned how to put together a almost completely disassembled multi-sectional modular long arm frame with a particular emphasis on making sure it was level and flat and that the rails were parallel with each other so that the machine will move smoothly when you want it to and most importantly won't move when you don't want it to to give the quilter a great smooth experience and to optimize their quilting exactness. Uh, if you have any questions, please comment below our uh, video on the face on the YouTube site. I'll be watching those. We'll answer as I can. If you'd have a, like to send an email, send it to info at longarm-tech.com or we have a Facebook page. Feel free to comment there. Uh, I'd love to have ideas for future videos you'd like to see, questions I can answer. If we bought something, call us on it and we'll work that out. In the meantime, Hope you and or your quilting partner has fun quilting. And if we can be of service in the future, let us know. In the meantime, stay tuned to longhome-tech.com. Thanks.